Swimming in a nearby river isn't always the best idea, especially if you live in an area prone to pollution or environmental or agricultural runoff. Ear and eye infections, gastrointestinal problems, these are some of the more mild issues that waterborne bacteria can cause. But in some parts of southern England, including its beaches, artificial intelligence is finding a role in monitoring bacteria. One company working on this deploys sensors at swimming spots. They measure water temperature, acidity, oxygen and ammonia levels, the presence of chemicals, and they use that info to predict whether it's safe to swim, and then they publish it on a mobile app, letting people know what conditions are like. Can't this be done the old-fashioned way, by taking water samples and sending them to a lab for testing? Yes, but that process can take longer while the water's bacteria levels can change. If the AI efforts catch on, supporters hope they'll be used to improve safety and the overall cleanliness of the UK's waterways. But there are some concerns about the costs of projects like this, who pays for them, and whether that can trickle down to Britain's bills. Hi, I'm Carl Azus, and it is great to have you watching the world from A to Z. We're taking you to Southern Asia next, where heavy flooding has affected roughly 7 million people, most of them in the nation of Bangladesh. Seasonal monsoons typically soak this region in the summertime. It's no stranger to floods and overflowing rivers. But this year's rains have been especially destructive here and in parts of neighboring India. In fact, some Bangladeshis blame India for why things are so bad. They accuse India of opening floodgates at dams near its border with Bangladesh, causing the waters to rise. India denies being responsible, saying it didn't intentionally release any water, but that its floodgates are designed to open when levels get too high. Dozens of lives have been lost to flooding in the two countries. By the end of the weekend, the water levels were slowly going down, but the threat of more problems remains as monsoon season continues through October. Word and out. Which of these spacecraft had its first crew test flight in June? Dragon, Orion, Starliner, Soyuz. The troubled craft that launched on June the 5th but won't be able to return its astronauts as planned is named Starliner. What was supposed to be roughly an eight-day mission to space is now in its 11th week. Issues with the Boeing Starliner spacecraft kept astronauts Sonny Williams and Butch Wilmore aboard the International Space Station longer than expected. And NASA announced a stunning turn of events Saturday. NASA has decided that Butch and Sonny will return with Crew-9 next February and that Starliner uh, will return uncrewed. The Starliner vehicle suffered setbacks with helium leaks and thrusters that abruptly stopped working on the initial leg of its first crewed test flight. Engineers spent weeks trying to understand the problem and alternative ways to bring the crew home. We have contingency options. We've put those in play. NASA always has contingency options. One of those contingencies is using the SpaceX Crew-9 Dragon spacecraft coming to the rescue. NASA has repeatedly said that SpaceX's potential to step in highlights how the agency intentionally designed its commercial crew program. Crew-9 mission will now configure Dragon for two crew members and will provide seats for Butch and Sonny to return. We're also working to finalize those crew assignments and update the training plan. The possible root cause was heat building up inside the thrusters that may be causing insulating seals to bulge. And NASA ultimately decided that Starliner is not yet safe enough for the journey home. Space is hard, and you better not mess it up. I'm Rick Damagella reporting. On this date in world history, August 26th, 1498. The artist Michelangelo was hired to carve the Pietà. The statue depicting Jesus and Mary, which remains on display today in the Vatican, is one of Michelangelo's most famous works, and he started it when he was 23 years old. August 26, 1883, after months of rumblings, explosions, and spewing ash clouds, the Indonesian island of Krakatau, or Krakatoa, saw a tremendous volcanic eruption. It was so powerful that most of the island collapsed, 
and the tsunamis that followed the eruption were so strong that they destroyed numerous towns and villages. The disaster killed an estimated 36,000 people. And on this date in 1920, the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution was ratified. It followed decades of marches and lobbying by American women seeking the right to vote. Where in the world? This is one of the countries where the Blue Danube flows. This nation borders nine other countries in Europe, and it has the continent's largest economy. This is Germany, which is known to Germans as Deutschland. Since our show launched a year ago, we've reported on events from about a hundred different countries. And one thing we thought was interesting is how those nations got their names. Why are many called one name by their people and something entirely different by those who live outside them? Here's Chloe Hendon with the answers. If you ask an English speaker the name of this country, they'd say Germany. But if you ask a German speaker, they'd say Deutschland. The name Germany is an exonym created by people outside the country. Deutschland is an endonym, created by the people who live in that country. Exonyms are often given to groups of people or places by settlers or military conquerors. Think America after Americo Vespucci and Colombia after Columbus. Sometimes exonyms become endonyms and sometimes endonyms become exonyms, often because of mistranslation or mispronunciation. That's what happened with Japan. China originally named it Sipan Guo, meaning Land of the Sun's Origin. Japan adopted the moniker, and over the years, it morphed into Nihon. When Christopher Columbus came to Malaysia, he heard of the foreign land Jipan, likely a variation of China's Sipan. Columbus wrote it as Jiapango, which influenced many countries' names for Japan. Oftentimes, exonyms come from a characteristic of the natives that foreigners notice. Numerous countries' exonyms are just words that mean, or used to mean, barbarian. Going back to Germany, from the Latin Germania, from Romans who heard from the Gauls about a tribe there called the Germani. It's thought to mean neighbor or men of the forest. The French and Spanish names for the country come from the tribe name Alemanni, probably meaning all men, a reference to the mixed nature of the tribe. Centuries later, when the German states unified, Deutschland, meaning the people's land, was officially adopted. Most countries are unbothered by their international nicknames, so there's not a lot of pressure to ditch the exonyms. And even when there is, making the switch isn't easy. What do you call these two countries? Turkey or Turkey A? Qatar or Qatar? With so many different names and pronunciations for countries, it seems like we can't agree on anything. But it might be a comfort to know that no matter what they sound like, countries' names will usually mean something like a description of the country's directional position, a feature of its land, a tribe name, or an important person. First time we've made a stop in the Show Me State this season, that's Missouri. That's the home of Belton High School. That's where Miss Harrell's or Harrell's class is watching from the city of Belton. In Goose Creek, South Carolina, it's nighttime, y'all. We've got Coach Santor's class online at Stratford High School. And from Durant, Oklahoma, we welcome Mr. Mitchell's class at Durant High School. The Lions are on the prowl in the Sooner State. A lot of zip lines stretch a few hundred feet and take you anywhere from 20 to 40 miles per hour. But when you've got a little more space, a good location in the Alps, and you're looking to give visitors a zip of a trip they won't soon forget, you build something like the Zipline Stodatzinken. It's located in the European country of Austria, and one of its sections is almost a mile long. For a fee of $30 for kids and $47 for adults, People zip along at speeds of more than 70 miles per hour, and it heights as far up as 393 feet. Is it crowded? Well, there's always a line, and we're not gonna string you along. You can't just get hooked and hang out. If things get down to the wire and people need cable access, zipline operators won't cut you any slack if you're tied up and they need to clamp down on people who won't try to leave the launch point to harness the suspenseful thrill others have Kara been waiting for. I'm Carl Lazus, zipping through some puns on the world from A to Z. We hope you'll fly with us again tomorrow. You mean the world to me.